on that day. Okay. But when I left school, you could get a job. And I, and I was working everywhere. And my dad said to me, he said, hey, he said, you've got every opportunity in the world to get a good job, you. He said, listen, he said, but what you want to do, he said, instead of messing around, you want to get yourself a trade. Now, I've always listened to me dad, because he's like, typical northerner, you know what I mean, clever. I remember the day war broke out. He was in the back kitchen at the time, cutting his thumb off. But anyway. <laughs> he went down to personnel in Camelheads. He walked in. He said, I've come about the job as a boiler maker. The fella said, have you filled the questionnaire in? He says, no. So he went outside and he battered the doorman. But he come back. He said, how's your general knowledge? He said, oh, I'm very good at general knowledge. He said, well, give us two days of the week. That'll be given the letter T. He says, today and tomorrow. <laughs> and he got it. Supported by the OAP's live entertainment survives. But during the week, support for a miners' strike withered, leaving only the major problem of who is to run the ailing industry. In the background of the dispute, Mr Ian McGregor, chairman of British Steel, whose appointment to run the coal board is expected soon. Labour's energy spokesman John Smith says he should not get the job. That would be provocative and divisive. Scargill is blaming Mr McGregor as being the butcher. Yeah. Well, the steel work situation is nothing compar comparable with the mines at all. In steel, there was uh, threats from overseas and too much capacity. Now, with the mines, there's a tremendous potential and new markets in Europe. So, all that McGregor is likely to do there is to improve the mines so that we can expand those markets and the miners and the country will benefit from it. In other words, he will be positive. I don't believe that he will carve it up. I think he will be positive. Well, I notice that the press have conditioned the miners and the public to the acceptance that Ian McGregor will be appointed uh, chairman of the National Coal Board. And I don't know what they think about a 70-year-old Yankee coming into the mining industry, but his intention is quite clear, to butcher this industry as they did in the 50s and 60s. The trouble with me is that I can see both points of view. I can see it their side as well. It's sabotage, nothing more but sabotage. It's a rather dictatorial attitude to say to people, if you want to keep your job, you'll have to move 50 miles but away. So what? Other people have to move uh, occasionally. There are many people on the dole today who will be glad to move uh, to, to travel uh, and one hour to work in order to, get, to receive £200 a week and pensions and jobs for life. Uh, redundancy payments if they want them, wonderful handouts. And being given £1,200, is it, for the inconvenience of moving? I think that's quite immoral, and, and that in itself is wrong. No, it's time we had some ju industrial justice in this country, and this nonsense has gone far enough. It should be stopped. British Steel's chairman, Mr Ian McGregor, who's in Scotland, has confirmed that he wants to take over a loss-making American steel plant, despite angry reaction to the idea. The plan would be American import controls, but it would also mean 2,000 men losing their jobs at the Ravenscraig steel plant near Glasgow. Before steel, we saw it in the railways. They shut an odd station down, they shut an odd station down here, there, another one somewhere else. And finally, at the end of the day, they've driven the wedge in really hard to get rid of uh, uh, quite a lot of rail traffic. Same thing happened in steel, and sooner or later we found ourselves basically without a steel industry. Why should the government have to keep pouring money into things that are no longer economic. Why can't the corner shops say, well, we're not economic? You know, we'll have a few quid off the government to keep us going for a little bit longer. Because after all, that is all that they want to do, keep it going a little while longer. If McGregor goes in and tries to do what he did with the, um, with the steel industry, um, then I think the mine workers and Arthur Scargill have got a right to be, uh, to be very worried about it. I think they've more or less decided they are going to put him in. I think they're just trying to decide how much to pay him at the moment, you know. Should it be three million or, or four million this time, you know. I think, I think Ian McGregor's had a very good history in the British Steel Corporation. I think the miners are probably, or would, would probably be worried if they knew he was to be appointed because they would feel that the coal industry in the country was going to be, you know, slashed to pieces and thousands are going to be thrown out of work. I don't think that will actually be the case. I think the miners have a right to fear for their jobs, uh, especially in view of this, this McGregor fellow. <coughs> uh, he, uh, he absolutely decimated the <coughs> steel industry, didn't he? Whole areas are, are just industrial wastelands now because of these, the way he streamlined the steel industry. So I suppose it's only right to, to sympathise with the miners because they can see this, this happening, you know, with the coal board. It's like a chain reaction. So they've got to stand the ground now. If they're not standing the ground now, even though it's a little pit and it might be make, making a loss, they've got to stand the ground. Yeah. Can you see a miner doing what we're doing now, sat in a cabin? They would do this now. If, look at us now. Sorry, yeah, look, at the, the, look at the jobs that we've, we've done before. Yeah. And we've ended up sitting in the bloody cabin. Jeff, he's a bricky. 
I worked in a paper mill all my life, and I'm sat in a bloody cabin now doing. Mm. I worked in textiles. Well, the miners, what's the like miners, They would if yeah. they had no option. They would. They got the budget next week. They don't know why they have a budget. No one's got any money. That's uh, Jeffrey Howe. I don't know how we got a knighthood. If he was down on one knee and the Queen said arise, he doesn't know what arise is, does he? Only really there off flaming week. We've been on this scheme since the 25th of October, and there's two of us at the moment. We're still paying emergency tax, which makes it a bit difficult. Uh, I have managed to get a rent rebate, so things are better like that. We should be able to smoke 20 cigarettes, buy 20 cigarettes, go out every night, but it's like a one night, one night a week now. You get your wages, pay your bills all the time, you've got to have at least one night out, or else you just look at four walls all the time, and it's no good. You go demented, won't you? You know, like a bit of baby's clothes and... There's always something that crops up every week, like, you know. Mm. Like, we're not too bad, only it's the people that's unemployed that really suffer, I think. And with this budget coming up, they're going to really suffer more. I think, so you know, the, the old age pension, it's a totally unrealistic level because, the, given prices today, there's no way that these people can make, can make ends meet. And you get an absolutely disgusting situation where poor old dears are sitting at home, Freezing. Grafted all their lives, you know, they're, they're sitting at home in the winter, freezing to death the because they can't the afford the gas. Because you, you've got these ludicrous standing charges. Yeah. When people are working and everything, they can go on strike for more and more. What can pensioners do? They're not going <laughs> to bloody rally off down bloody <laughs> London. Oh, they're 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 walking they're 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 about them. They, they, they get thrown to one side. They can't do anything about it. So government will think. Oh, like, you know. They just totally pushed to one side, don't they? you know, they're over 60, go, go away, you know, that's it, innit? I think we'll be all in the same boat. After the budget, well, end of this scheme, we're going to be back on door. Out of my wage of £102.64 pence a week, it, I mean, it might sound like a, you know, a reasonable sort of wage compared to what the rest of the lads get. But I pay £15 a week tax, I pay £6.60 something superannuation, then I pay £6 odd uh, my national insurance. So I'm taking home something in the region of £72 to £73 a week. Now, uh, it's nobody else's fault only me own, but I've got five children at home and uh, I pay maintenance for another child. So there's like seven of us at home plus the maintenance has got to be sent off so we must pay something in the region of 30 pounds a week for food i mean then there's there's milk um, and then there's your bread and then there's the electricity meter swallows that much money up you wouldn't believe it it's only because the wife is such a good manager that we managed we, we're, we're able to get a little bit of money saved because i think if you if you get to the situation where you're living just hand to mouth where you, your wage is being immediately swallowed up and there's nothing left to save then you're never ever getting anywhere, are you? Just staying still. You may as well go out and bloody string yourself up from a tree because you're, you know, you're just never ever going to get up the sit from the, you know, from off your off your backside, are you? You're always going to be in the poverty trap. You mean the only two kids that you need over the afternoon? Mate, you used to go in, nothing. You bloody fuck it. I don't know why you managed your bloody business. Oh, you bloody think about you bloody managed bloody BBB, bloody business about jobs. Anyway, but you're not your bloody mates. I spend enough bloody time. You bloody spend enough time. Go and live with them. Go ahead. Go down to their bloody house. Go and stay with them. Go ahead. Shut up. Is that you? I said, oh, mister, come here, precious. Get away from me, you, you stink a drink, you're a swine. Come here, start blowing in her ear. <laughs> Give her a little nibble on the neck and that. <laughs> little nibble on the shoulder. <laughs> little nibble on the right booby and a little nibble on the... A little nibble on the belly button. Little nibble on the kneecap. She turns around and says, you wouldn't have passed it if it was a pub. Throughout history, the role of pub and landlord has been central in the community. For the government, the genial mine host is simply an unpaid tax collector. Oh, for example now, whiskey. Whiskey, a bottle of whiskey. The cost to produce, 140. The wholesale profit is 51 pence. The VAT is 94 pence. But the duty is £4.34, making the total for the bottle of £7.19. The average person can only work to his pocket, and if that, uh, there's any more pennies put on the beer, uh, it will make it that uh, 
people will stop drinking less and never less they will and people will go out of business because even though um, we're putting the beer up, for the profit that I'm making and the bills I get for electricity and uh, oil and, you know, the general running of the place is going up at the same time, so I'm no better off, actually. I, I'm no, getting nowhere near. In fact, it's getting that way that people will start having to use their own money. And if a person in business has to use his own money, then the business is not right. Of course, that's obviously it's not right. Bill plans to leave a floundering England. There are no such options for those caught in the poverty trap. People like Bob and Miriam. We won't have to go round, be a bit. So we're oh. box side, we're collecting. Oh, it's going not, like that's, 1930s. Oh, that's not the point, is it? Like prescription, these old people now, these prescriptions now, they're up for tall people now, aren't they? Yeah, and they can't afford them, you know. Oh, they no. can't afford them now, oh. because I know a certain person that goes to the doctors and she rips her prescription up because she can't afford to get hurt. She can't afford to get these tablets she's on. They might saw her up to about two pounds a, a bottle or, or tablets or every time you go up. And if you go for about three or four commodities, it's going to be about six or seven pounds. What are you going to get it off? Well, if you're ill, you're not going to be able to afford to have it. You're just going to have to lie down and die, aren't you? I mean, that's what they're really saying. If, you, if you're not well, you're unfit, you just get down and die. And I mean, she has a husband, aren't she? A millionaire. She's two children of her own. Surely she should have, she should have some feelings or something, or is her heart swinging brick? No, I'm not against them saying, well, we'll get pensioners free electric or something like that. I'm not against that. I'm not even against paying an extra penny a pint if I thought it were going for pensioners. I don't want to be paying extra money for blokes like McGregor, McGregor where they, 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 they pay millions of pounds compensation to a, a company where they've got him from. You know, I think it's bloody ludicrous. I mean, we'll live with budgets forever and a day, but I'm just saying they ought to think of them a bit at the bottom, like us. It's no good saying all over the country it's 150 pound a week, it isn't. Here, it's about 80. So I don't think anybody that earns 80 pound a week should pay tax. You know now, before budget comes out, you know now that it's going to be fights, beer and petrol again. You know that. And it sure was the working fella that cops most of it. When I were a lad, a pint of beer were 10 pence and a whiskey were one and three. Now we've got a pint's 48 and a whiskey's 46. Who are they looking after there? Yeah, but what I'm saying is whiskey, the rich man's drink, has not gone up in the same proportion as, as ale is. Now, why should that be? No. The really wealthy people should pay a lot more than what they do now. The club handles a quarter million pound turnover, but for a chancellor, it's small beer. We have in the past said, if it's gone up 2p, we've said, well, we'll put it up 1, and we've absorbed 1, but... The trouble is today, every bill you get, they all say, it's gone up 15p for inflation. I mean, it's nearly always 15 or 10, yet we get rises of 4%, but every bill you get has gone up 10% or 15%. Running any sort of business, it's just the same as running country, but if you run it country, it's a bit easier because you can just say, Tax is going up and you have to pay it. If we said to members, ale's going up and you have to pay it, they can say, well, no, we're not. They'll not come in. But you have to pay tax. With increasing unemployment, the Exchequer may soon have to find other ways of raising revenue. A working man, I mean, he's entitled to a drink, he's entitled to a smoke. Well, what do they want him to do? Pack everything up and just work, 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 work? He put more on defence. It definitely will do. And he'll get out people and pensions and uh, and all like that. He'll just give them a little bit. He'll not give them a lot, because they're not yeah. they're not good artists and conservatives for giving money. Only to their own, you know. They'll just give them a little bit for vote catching. No, I don't I don't think he'll give anything myself much. I don't think he much away. But I do think he should get pension. Oh, pensions arise, you know, if it costs a living and that. Well, I mean, say, I mean know. even council rents have gone up, haven't they? Yeah. One yeah. pound odd. So if he only gives you one pound odd, I mean, you're nothing in pocket, are you? Mm. At all. Well, I like to see cost of living coming down myself. Food. Mm. Food. Uh, when our Robert leaves at Easter, you know, his family will also come off. And my, my disability pension will, will go down, only 13 pounds. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. he will lose his family allowance. 
and I lose uh, eight pound off mine. Mm -hmm. So mine will drop at, uh, eight pound on my fa family allowance, thirteen pound. Now, uh, <coughs> now if he goes up here to sign on, if he's if he's not lucky enough, which to get a job, you know, mm -hmm. you know, well we're. It's going to, we're going to be hard, isn't it? Yeah, like, you know. Local industries plea to the Chancellor, free enterprise and more privatisation. Nationalised industries soak up millions and millions of pounds a year in taxpayers' money and contribute nothing towards our economy. The whole of the recession that we've been through, along with the rest of the world, has been born on the backs of private industry in this country. They're the people who have paid the taxes to subsidise these nationalised giants. They're the people who have turned around and had to subsidise the dole queues, which have been created purely and simply because we've had these nationalised industries for so long that the country's economy once reached the point where we actually had to turn around and ask the IMF for money to stop us going bankrupt. Now, those are the people you ought to be looking at. Private industry in this country has stood firm and said, all right, we will support whatever needs support them to keep this country on its feet. And unfortunately, a lot of people in this country still believe that they're entitled to a job because they live in this country and they're not prepared to accept the fact that to earn a decent day's pay, they've got to give in a decent, pay, a decent day's work. And that's half the problem in this country. So don't turn around and say that we should be out of a, if you like, a national uh, feeling of gratitude supporting these loss-making nationalised industries. It's absolutely pathetic. Uh, one thing I have noticed uh, since the war is that uh, cash flow is a problem for everybody and I find that it's almost like being in a re banana republic nowadays. The Victorians got a terrific credit system going, checks, bills of exchange and so on, and nowadays nobody trusts you for credit. One of my biggest disappointments is that with uh, multinationals taking over and uh, people being merged or swallowed up, your credit, which has been very, very good, say, for 40 years, is now being queried. There's been cosmetic efforts by various governments to improve the lot of the small and medium companies, but it is merely lip service, in my opinion. Business should evolve wherever the labour or capital is, or the natural resources are, and then the assistance we want is to be left alone and have a cut in all the bureaucracy. Gold has doubled in price in the last six months. It dropped $55 in one day. The pound, which was two, uh, where, where the dollar you could get two and a half dollars for a pound, is now one and a half dollars to the pound. But some of these goods that I've got here are actually priced at the price that we bought them in August of 1982, at the very most $200 an ounce, and it went to $511 an ounce. It's a very worrying thing, because if you sell it at that price, you cannot replace it. You, can't, you haven't got enough money out of the profit of the sale to buy again. If you think, for instance, Kruger Rands, which were selling at uh, £40 a piece, are now £320-odd, and have been 400 if he gives incentive to that small businessman, then he will be giving incentive to this country because the, the small businessman is the bedrock of employers. They are the people who are the employers of one, two, three, four, five staff. And there are thousands and thousands. I believe there are a quarter of a million small businesses in this country. If, they only, if, if every one of those employed two more people as a result of the incentive from the Chancellor, what a wonderful boost that would be for the unemployment figures. I'd like to see more money put into industry, for reinflation of some of the industry, because if we go on like this for another two years, it's going to be very difficult to get our industrial base back. We're still losing our industrial base. I mean, mill after mill's causing, industry after industry is feeling a real shock on uh, some of the, particularly in the export fields and things of this character. And we're going to be in a situation, if we go on like this for another two or three years, we're not going to have any industrial base left. They don't really g ever give you anything. It's very seldom you really get a good budget where you feel like, well, there you are, I've got something. Normally you think to yourself, oh, that's all right. And a little bit further they say, oh, sorry, now that's gone. <laughs> that's, they've took that back again now. <laughs> you know, so you, you, you can't really win with them. It, they, they just, they'd be better off if they didn't have budgets, really. If they're going to cut the income tax, as is rumoured, 
maybe we shall have to suffer for it in some other way. And food could be one of these things. Uh, the price of food could go up, I suppose, and being a housewife, I don't approve of that, so really I think it would be better if we left well alone at the moment. You've put your finger on it from my point of view, that we should leave well alone. I think people, by and large, are quite uh, satisfied to see things going on as they are, uh, wh barring unemployment, I mean. But they're not, though. There's a lot of competition. Uh, but people are yes, but the chief grumble is unemployment, isn't it? Yeah, but if, look, if we turn on the tap now, we shall increase public spending, interest rates will soar, uh, foreign exchanges will be affected, if we put a ban on imports, then our competitors overseas may refuse to accept our goods overseas. Yeah. So the net result of that will be far, far more spending, inflation will increase, and unemployment oh, in due course will go higher and higher. Mm -hmm. It's like taking medicine now and putting up with it. Mm -hmm. We're on course, we're winning, and every sensible thinking person in this country must realise this in, in, the, in his heart. And Mrs. Thatcher has repeated that we've all got to stand on our own feet. There have to be no lame ducks. Well, let's get rid of these lame ducks. Let's all bat on the same wicket and play by the same rules. That's how we can get this country right. But the state is an imperfect machine, sometimes creating rules that perpetuate inequality. For instance, widows and the clawback rule. I am forced to take a low wage because of the tax situation, because of the widow's pension that she, you know, that I'm allowed. It's not my fault that I'm a widow. This budget, I would like to see her helping people that are on their own. Not just widows, there must be a lot of widows that have to work to work. They must work to work because a widow's pension just isn't enough to survive on. And yet, when you are willing to come out to work, with what you earn and what they take off you, it's hardly worth coming to work. I mean, I come out to work now and I'm left off with by the time I've paid what I have to pay, I'm working now for a pound an hour. It's not, um, it's not your fault that you're left on your own. You seem just to be punished. No. And I think it's only when it hits you that you realise how some people must be living. You know, every time there is a budget, it doesn't seem to help the working class at all. For some reason or other, I don't know why, but it doesn't. I think that w there will be possibly some sort of tax relief for everybody. I would like to see the tax limits raised, um, not greatly, but slightly, so that people that were once considered to be fairly well off, uh, I, I think, are the ones that have really sort of copped out this last few years, because everybody's earning sort of more money, um, and the limits haven't been raised sufficiently. So I, I would think that, you know, people that are on... £18,000, then the tax limit should be raised, perhaps to £20,000. Well, my income here is £60 a week, what I receive. That's from family allowance and uh, my husband's pension, you know, things like that. And I pay £1.40 for children's dinners daily, you know. And then I have my rent, uh, £10 a week out of that for heating, because it's such a big place and I have to be kept warm and he has to be kept warm. Uh, and then there's clothing him. You know, we put a bit away for that. And of course, my television, that's the only enjoyment I get, really, because I don't go out, I don't drink. I think that if this five pence television license just come in for disabled, it will help me in a big way. I have to have a, you know, I have to have a cleaner in three days a week. I pay her, you know, well, I pay her six pound a week. And then if, she, if my husband's not well and he can't go her in, I give her extra, you know, because I don't want anything for nothing. I have a good daughter, and she gives us a bit a week, you know, and we put a bit for clothing, a bit for holidays, you know, away. And uh, like I said, they've got to like vary from month to month, from child to child, because a pair of shoes for my lad's about 20 odd pound, and I've just bought him a coat 22 pound, because he's 16, and the other one's coming up to 15, and I like them well clothed and looking decent, which they always have done and always will do, you know. I mean, myself, since I had been married, I mean, I'm a bit emotional. <laughs> it's been like, uh, we've not been able to work myself. I've always been on a low income. And with three children, it's been our doing, you know. 
I want to stop on it. Just how many of Darwin's hopes and needs were met in this afternoon's budget speech? He's put child benefit up, which is going to be of great benefit to an awful lot of families. I'm surprised that it went up by so much. I did expect a small increase, but I didn't think that it would be as much as 65 pence per child. It won't buy anything at all. Um, won't even buy a pair of stockings for a child. It won't buy nappies, it won't buy... In fact, I don't even think it'd buy a tin of baby food. I think it's going to be good for business in general. Uh, the economy is being, is being given a boost, and that must help to improve everything all around and improve job, the job situation. It's no good giving them training jobs, because you can train a man to do a job, but if there's no job at the end of there, it's absolutely useless, because it, there just is no jobs. I would like to have seen some sort of uh, help you know, for industry to get people back to real jobs, back to work properly. Um, it's an electioneering budget, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, they're giving quite a bit away on the face of it, but it'll all be snatched back, I suppose, in the mini-budget later on in the year. One good thing about it, um, from my point of view, is the enterprise scheme has been extended now na nationally. Uh, in the past, this government credit guarantee scheme has meant that uh, the government has guaranteed 75%, but the question is, who provides the other 25? Obviously, the, the, the employer or the businessman must do that, but if he's already committed with an existing loan with the bank, then he can't find that extra 25%. So therefore, like many of these other help schemes for small businesses, they don't help an awful lot the existing business. I can see myself perhaps taking advantage of that. But at the same time, that's the government, that really what they're saying is, well, go out and do it yourself because we can't help you. You'll have to do it yourself. And I've always said that the only person who'll ever get me back to work probably is myself. If we get unemployment, uh, inflation down, it'll create employment. So in 1981, it's 12%, and there's a million unemployed. In 1983, it's 6%, and there's three and eight bloody million unemployed. So I would hate to think what had happened if they got it to zero. There might be ten bloody million unemployed. See, I don't understand there they do these figures, you see. I'm not, I don't sit there study financial times. I read bloody page three and, you know, I'm not really concerned. Because, like I say, every budget comes along like bloody birthdays. I've still go, got to go to work, get as much overtime in as I can. Just say, Emma. He ought to have reduced uh, duty on derv. Nobody employs these huge vehicles for pleasure. And also, he's done nothing about the duty on heavy fuel oil for raising steam in factories, which is not a luxury. For the past four years, we've been governed by basically by Alibaba and the 40 Thieves. And looking at the situation now, the 40 Thieves have had a bit of remorse probably because the, the Ball Street runners, in the way of the general public, are looking over their shoulders because of the election situation, and they're now deciding that they'll give you a little bit back. They've done nothing at all for, what, for the people, for the disabled, for instance. They've done nothing at all as far as bringing down the cost uh, of prescriptions. The budget's done nothing at all as far as the poorer classes of, uh, of the community are concerned. Hey, you, did you hear? 